Hi guys, welcome to this Western Bartonshire Libraries event. I'm Graham Armstrong, author of The Young Team, and I'm going to be speaking to you today about my debut novel. Um, I'm going to do a short talk to introduce myself, um, where I came from, who I am, how I got to writing the novel, chat around the novel. Um, I'm going to give you a few short readings, and then afterwards um, there's some Q&As that the, uh, the audience have kindly sent in in these crazy Covid times. Um, just before we get started, there's a there's a couple of wee warnings. So the first one, um, if any of you know me uh, and know the work, is a profanity warning. So there will be some strong language, guys. Um, so if you get any little ears listening, pop them off into the next room. The next one is um, a trigger warning. So we're going to be talking around um, violence and suicide today. So if you've got any um, experiences of that, guys, just be warned. Um, and the final one is obviously it's a wee spoilers warning alert as well. So um anyway, so welcome. I'm gonna kick us off with a reading. I think it's best to get started, get some energy going, okay. Um the novel starts um it's around gang culture in Airdrie, um in Coat Bridge, inspired by my own experiences back then. And um uh, I'll read I'll read first, to kick us off guys. So the uh, the young team who's uh, our our, um, our gang has um, had a death threat painted on a wall in their area by the rival gang, the young toy, um, and they've been told by one of the parents to go up and clean it off. We all nod our thanks and start walking up to the top park. There's nothing to it really, just two swings and a wee shoot. This isn't your real hunt. The wains of the scheme tend to have this part to themselves. And you often see a squad of moz with prams here and that and smoking fags. You used to get told off for wrapping the swings round the frames when you were a bit younger and hunted for hanging about this one. We all shifted down the bottom park after that. You love your wee part and dance when you're a wee guy, but something changes when you enter your teenage years and you just wanted to smash them up. We reach the top park and clock it. A wooden fence, floating and exposed, runs the length of the back perimeter of the park. The message is scrawled in four foot white spray painted letters. Kenzie, Azzy, Bruni, dead men walking, young toy in your area. Big Kenzie mar laughs and marches up to it. Fucking shoddy work boys. Typical YTB lazy job. We're not laughing really. That twingy paranoia has spread through us. There's no names left but we knew for sure they'd all been here. A full squad up looking for us. Big Kenzie pulls out the roller tray for his bag and starts pouring the crisp out of it. It splashes onto the paint tray in big fat glugs. He hands me a glove and a paintbrush and wee Kenzie the wire brush. Mind your arms and eyes now, boys. The old crisp oak can be nippy. It smells like fire, pure brimstone in your nostrils, thick chemicals choking you. But it takes me back years to my granny's shed. We start slopping the thick brown liquid over the fence. And wee Kenzie scrapes the hard wire brush against the floating surface and scrubs the paint off till it's dusty and faded. The dark brown crisotes covers the remnant of the paint and her death threat begins to disappear. I glance towards wee Kenzie, whose face must be like a mirror image of my own. This was far for him to come. We knew that. Right, boys, nice even brush strokes now on the one direction. Big Kenzie says, the half fag hanging out his mouth, laughing casual. The two are looking at him. Bah! He says with a shrug. Wee Kenzie goes back to scrubbing the plank with a wire brush. Do you not care, Tam? I say. He turns and gives me a look, and I see his sore looking scar. As he wee man, we all care. But it's not just a case of caring or no. I'm not going to sit and shite myself for these fucking cunts. But our paint's not going to hurt us. Big Kenzie's face had healed. But it left him with a big tan mark, ear to fucking lip. He lets a couple of days stubble grow in before he shaves now, and often is a part too beard to hide the match. You're a daft cunt, Tom, Wee Kenzie says. We both turn to look at him, surprised. He'd barely spoke all day. What are you talking about, kid? You're no invincible, you stupid prick. Do you not realise you've broke Mama's fucking heart coming fade with a face like that? It scares it, look at you now. Oh, fucking pardon me for getting slashed, you wee fucking dick. If you hadn't started with Devin Marty, it wouldn't have happened. You listen to me, wee bro. They cunts are fucking animals. And if it hadn't happened to me, it would have happened to one of yous. 
So I'm glad it happened to me. These are still wee guys. I would have felt bad. Mate, they've not heard the last of that. They're fucking old for you, Nick. As you're going to end up getting it as well. Do you think he's a mental? Big Kenzie turns and slaps his wee brother's face. A fucking beauty. Fucking man up, you wee turgy. Me and Azzy didn't fucking start this, but we've got a fucking boss to end it. I'm the tat fucking man about here. We Kenzie's raging, holding back tears. Well, you can fucking tell my mom when you kill somebody, because I'm no ya prick. John, fucking calm down, mate. I know you get a fright when I get slashed, but you can't just get hot and that's it, I'm done, mate. I'll always need to watch now. And so the fuck will you. He's a fucking YTP bo- no boys. Welcome to the young team. Um, guys, it's crazy. Um, it was a crazy environment back then. So let's let's cycle back. 2005, um, the World Health Organization declared Glasgow murder capital of Europe. Um, you know, I was involved in gangs back then. I'd started running about in young teams in Airdrie, um, 2003-2004. Around that year, I remember there was 12 murders in our circumference. Um, for a town of 100,000 people, guys, it's horrendous, you know. They were largely fueled by people carrying knives, um, by drink. The majority of, of violent homicides and violence uh, in general was carried out by drunk people. Um, you know, and the schools that we went to, um, they were split. You know, there was always an awareness of territorialism. You know, every area had a young team. Very similar to parts of Glasgow and our parts of Scotland. Um, you know, and, and the young team and the young toy... I fictionalised those names, you know, the reality was they would have been the suffix and the end of the name, so if it would have been Airdrie Young Team, Coat Bridge Toy, for example, you know, I wanted to make it obviously fiction, you know, the last thing I wanted to do with this novel was create a shrine, um, or glorify it for young people, you know, so my, my own introduction to gangs came in, in those early years, um, and, it, and it wasn't this dramatic... Um, initiations that you see sometimes in American movies and stuff like that. It was literally just, there's all the our ones hanging about in the park. We're going to go and join them. We have a buck fast or I bought a mad dog, you know, MD2020. Um, we were all mera peaked up, you know, we were wearing Berghouse jackets, tracksuits, Lacoste tracksuits, football tracksuits. Um, that was the fashion back then, you know, and there'd be a crowd of guys, a crowd of girls, all the young ones aging for 12, 13, right up to 18, 19. Um, you know, and then they would have this name, you know, they would have this group identity, you know, and ours was the young Mavis, um, you know, and you start out being one of the wee guys, you know, you're just kind of hanging about with the older ones and then your coming of age happens throughout that process, you eventually become one of the elder ones, and guys, I went through that process, you know, I started as one of the wee nipples at the beginning, um, you know, half and in for ten fags, um, and, and drinking bottles of buck fast over a golf course, you know, in line paralytic, and then eventually you would be a very, very violent young man, you know, there'd be all sorts of fights. Airdrie wasn't particularly regimented gang culture, it was more individual violence, if you want to call it that, it was disputes over money, drugs, women, you know, personal dislikes of people, um, and a kind of violent circumference, um, you know, and that would be the process, you know, so until ages 12 to 14, I'd be running about in the streets drinking, and the first seismic moment for me, um, was being expelled from high school, I, um, I was involved in a violent incident, um, in my school, I was, um, I was expelled, you know, that, that's a real moment, and lots of people say they were expelled from school, but when you're formally, ex- good, you know, formally expelled from school, it generates a social work, uh, report, so you need to get a social worker coming to your house, you know, you need to go in front of the education authority, you need to go and find a new school, so I was out of mainstream education for three months um, and then um, I went down to Coatbridge High instead of Aird Academy um, and for anybody that knows Coatbridge the, the gang culture was much more akin to inner city Glasgow, so they had um, they had the same group identities as we did, young teams but they the conflict between them was much, much more aggressive. It was a very, very um, poisonous atmosphere between the gangs. They they actually hated each other. They didn't mix at all. It was like oil and water. Some of these guys, um, and I started running, running about with the Langone ones, which was um, it's a predominantly Catholic area, Coat Bridge, um, around the Time Capsule Weather Centre. Most people know where that is in Scotland. So, um, 
I started hanging about with those guys, um, and that's when I really, really experienced a lot of the stuff that we see in the young team, that really fierce tribalism, you know, because um, sometimes people say to me, oh, Airdrie wasn't that bad for young teams, it wasn't, um, the rest of the book was inspired on Airdrie, the locale, the setting of the book is absolutely Airdrie, um, and people recognise places, and that's, of course, intentional, um, but the conflict between the two gangs is, is fictional. Um, that was a blend of my experience in these two towns, based everything I would say in the book, even though it is fiction, is inspired by or based on something that did happen, you know, um, there's half-truths, is, is probably a nice way to say it, um, you know, that, that was my inception, and I, um, if you'd ask me back then, you know, when I was 14, 15, I thought it was amazing, you know, um, my, my dad died young, um, of natural causes, you know, and, I think that, that had a huge impact on my childhood, you know, even though I wasn't really conscious of it at the time, I think when I look back on my life, um, you know, I didn't have anybody to play football with, so I was a wee bit alienated in that way, um, I wasn't really into sports, and then um, I was exposed to this young teen gang culture, you know, and for the first time in my life, I actually fitted in, you know, and I thought, wow man, this is something I'm really good at, you know, and I looked like a proper little ticket, and I did, um, you know, and I loved being on it, it was... If you look back across youth culture in the in the UK, mods and rockers, casuals, Neds was the the nineties and noughties conception. Excuse me, that that youth culture, you know, and that cultural emblem um, of Mera Peaks, Buckfast, DJ Rankin, all the things that our generation relate to. Um, every generation's had theirs, you know. Neds was just ours, and it just so happened that it was a perfect storm, you know. Quite often when you're looking at a sociological or a criminology aspect and you look at, look at how violence occurs we look at trauma that happened years before you know so massive recession in the 80s in the heavy industry in the UK Scotland particularly affected that by that by mining ship building um, our communities were, were steelworks um, in Lanarkshire a lot in the mines etc when all those shut you had towns full of workers with no work um and that, that in these kind of places is a lethal mix, you know, so um, there was poverty, you know, and, and challenges and there was alcoholism. And then obviously as we move forward in time for the 70s, 80s, 90s, we've got illegal drugs coming into the mix as well. Um, you know, that sets the stage for, for this, you know, um, and for the culture that we experienced. We had that perfect storm, you know, the board was set, we had poverty, we had trauma, we had alcohol and drugs, we had a lack of opportunity. Um, and then if you look at the crime stats for the years, violence was on the rise, um, you know, and it rose steadily through the 90s, and it peaked in 2005, and it gave us that title, you know, of murder capital of Europe, um, and that's not a title you want, you know, and this, this friendly madman that we laugh at, these palatable psychopaths we have in Scotland, like the Kevin Bridges jokes, um, you know, some of those guys were stone cold killers, you know, and I don't think that they were evil, a lot of them, I think they were just, um, they really, really challenged, they came from bad backgrounds, they consumed alcohol and drugs, they carried a weapon to protect themselves, and then they met another young man from an opposing housing scheme doing exactly the same thing, or they met a random passerby, a complete innocent, and the inevitable happens, you know, violent crime, including homicide. Um, you know, some of the papers said that they loved the mystery for the young team. Guys, I don't think the mischief is a really the right word to use when you talk about this book. It was an incredibly violent gang culture, um, and I think that we were conditioned to be violent as part of that. Um, you know, the violence is um, is a factor, obviously, in this book. You know, and my hand on of it hopefully is tactful and sensitive. Um, the last thing I wanted to do was create this violent fantasy that you see in lots of male fiction. You know, um, if you're familiar with the football films, the uh, the Hogan films, Green Street and, and Football Factory, there's almost a kind of quasi-religious look at it, you know, that this is an amazing brotherhood and, you know, this is a great thing. But actually, the reality of violence, it, it's never good, you know. It's not a boxing match with a referee. Um, it's not like you see on TV, guys. You know, it's quite often... Um, really scrappy, people get hurt, you know, you never see that, see in, in films and all that, you see blood coming out of people and all that, but you don't see them going home to face their mum, you know, and you don't see their mum awake at night, you know, and their son coming in with broken teeth and you having to go to the dentist to get your teeth fixed and coming in with a broken nose, um, 
you know, that was the reality of violence, you know, and um, guys, I, I was very proud of my violence when I was young, and I think we all were, you know, we used to recount stories, the young team opens with them telling stories about these mythical figures, the older ones, you know, these guys were like, um, they were like heroes, you know, myth and legends, that's what I talk about in the book, they were like myths and legends, we used to see their names spray painted, and you would go, wow, I want to be like that guy, he's a hero, you know, um, but that was only ever the veneer guys, it was never the actual core that we seen back then, um, you know, and I was involved, I counted them all up, because I've been writing a memoir recently about all the true stuff that happened, and I counted them all up guys, and there was 16 instances of violence I was involved in, that maybe not sound like a lot, but when one punch can kill, um, I know two young men, friends of friends, who are both killed in a single punch, um, Anytime you lift your hands to somebody, it was potentially very, very serious. Um, and then the, the reverse of that's true as well. Anytime you were assaulted violently, it had lethal consequences sometimes. Um, and as I said, you know, I don't think these guys were particularly evil. I don't think they went out with the intent to kill. Um, but, you know, that was the result of this violence, that people did get seriously injured. Um, and there's a whole generation of young men... Um, an older men as well actually in Glasgow, you know, with terrible facial injuries, you know, these tan marks, slash wounds that go right down their cheek or across their lips, um, you know, and you, you became accustomed to tell the difference between one that had been done with a bottle or one that was done with a knife, the knife ones tended to be really thick, um, and the bottle ones tended to be lots of jaggy lines down people's faces, equally as lethal, um, and guys, it wasn't the lethality of the injury, it was the lethality that these guys couldn't get a job, no, they were stigmatised as criminals, um, I know guys that were completely innocent, they'd never actually lifted a hand to anybody, but they'd been in the wrong place at the wrong time, that old saying, and a bottle had been used against them, usually a Buckfast bottle, the bottles burst, they've been left with these terrible scar wounds on their face, and um, guys, there's a lot of stigma attached to that, you know, how do these guys go and get a job then, because they, they take one look at them and they go, nah, he's a gang, he's a gang member, you know, that's been... In reality, these guys are victims of crimes, you know, if you visit Glasgow, the west of Scotland, you'll see them all over, um, especially in the city centre, you know, and then there's the guys you don't see, um, who were, were murdered, you know, and I know of both victim and murderer in this, um, and that, that's sadly where they go, because at the beginning of this story, you know, we talk about wee boys, and it's young team this, and young team that, um, but as that trauma starts to compound things, you get to about 16, um, and then deaths start occurring, you know, I um, personally, we experienced drug deaths, suicides, murders, and um, that's when the, the, real, the real story of the young team starts to get a bit darker and a bit more serious, you know, um, and sadly that was a reality for many, many young men and women in our part of the world, um, the suicide rate is very high in Lanarkshire where I'm from, it's a real black spot for that. Um, and that's one of the main themes, you know, that, that recurs in the young team, is mental health, um, and I've got a wee reading for that later on. But the um, violence and suicide is the two readings that I'm going to give today, guys. Um, you know, predominantly I would say the, the book concerns itself with violence and then substance abuse. Um, you know, we, we're all familiar, when you say drug addict, when you use that term of substance dependent, everybody's mind just goes straight to that famous book, Train Spotting, um, and we think about heroin addiction. And see, when we were in school, we were getting social education about that. You know, and we watched videos of um, <laughs> these wee cartoon figures jumping about, and they were meant to be our bloodstream being invaded by HIV, um, you know, after sharing needles or after having unprotected sex. Guys, that was the 80s, you know, that was concerned with that, and then into the 90s. Our older guys, the guys who were born in the 70s and 80s, they come up in the 90s, they were Generation X, their main pre I, they were taking ecstasy, they were going to raves, they were going to dancings, but they were also using heroin, you know, and guys, we were nose to nose with that, I seen heroin addiction point blank range, I never myself used it, it wasn't our generation that did that, we had moved on to that by then, you know, but we dealt with the legacy of it, you know, um, We've seen it nose to nose, experienced overdose, lots of our older ones died because of it. Um, you know, and uh, our drug landscape was completely different then. We we really took party drugs. 
we were the generation of ecstasy, um, cocaine, speed now and again, but ma the majority of our time was spent taking ecstasy tablets. Excuse me. The um, When you speak to older ones, they talk about pills and they talk about the money involved. Um, and they used to say it was £10 a pill or £20 a pill. When we were taking them, it was £2 a pill. You know, so your pocket money could get you 10 ecstasy tablets. Um, and that that's a big artistic focus of mine on the young team as well. Because um, I wanted to put on the page the crazy hallucinogenic effect of those drugs. You know, and how, and I don't mean hallucinogenic in an acid or an LSD kind of way, just the actual effect on your consciousness, you know. You're taking something like 5 or 10 ecstasy tablets and sitting, you know, and the, the rush of feelings and sensations. Um, and you know, the um, it's a tightrope again, just like we spoke about with glorifying violence, you can quite easily glorify drug use. And if you look at lots of media outlets designed towards young people, they are almost always written by kids from middle or upper class backgrounds, and their attitudes to drugs are always exploratory. They are looking at drugs and substance abuse as a forbidden pleasure, not as something to manage trauma and um, in pain, you know, um, as was the case with lots of heroin addicts, you know, people who take heroin are not happy people, guys, this is not a, a drug that you take just, excuse me, out of curiosity, you know, it tends to be a sliding scale of substance abuse, where, um, you know, it's the drug of the desperate, you know, we were the opposite, guys, we were taking, we were t smoking cannabis was the way we started taking drugs, um, we smoked cannabis every day, you know, and we used to smoke cannabis resin and that was imported to the UK from abroad and it was very high quality stuff. Um, and they stopped importing. Maybe it was cost, who knows. But there was a revolution in the way we took drugs and, and manufactured cannabis and people started growing it. Um, and it became super sink, you know, herbal cannabis that we smoked green. And um, that frazzled a lot of people's mental health. You know, that was really, really... They talk about THC content in, in resin being about 4%. It went up to 20% and uh, more sometimes with the herbal stuff. And um, that's when we've seen the real drugs landscape change. You know, people were taking ecstasy tablets, they were smoking a stripper sink green. Um, and then ecstasy fell out of favour. You know, it became Mandy and MDMA people took. And um, I think that was largely because of legal highs. You know, legal highs were introduced and um, that revolutionised the landscape of drugs in the UK because you had these new creed of cheap synthetic drugs flooded and the old um, the old drugs had to rebrand, you know, so it became Mandy, so it was pure MDMA and then um, Prop, so it was really high strength cocaine, high purity, high cost as well. Our grams used to cost £40, this went up to £100. Um, you know, and, and the more expensive drugs are, the more violence that accompanies them, you know, and the more, that's why we're seeing more firearms incidents in Scotland now, um, is these young crews of guys that are, that are dealing in these drugs, um, are enforcing them with, with extreme violence, you know, um, and we see that transformation occur in the book, you know, we see Azzy and the young team, when they're young boys, they're taking the £2 extra to the tablets, they're having these experiences, they're getting... Um, swept into rave culture, you know, that was a huge part of the essence of that, you know, the revival, the rave revival in the noughties, 2005, 2010, all throughout then, massive raves in Scotland, and then after that, in 2012, it started to dwindle, um, but these super strength drugs stayed, and this is now the landscape our young people are dealing with, this is the drugs that teachers are seeing in school, it's um, it's high strength cocaine, high strength uh, herbal cannabis, not little bits of resin dope, you know, and this is a constantly evolving thing, youth culture, um, you know, so it's a funny one that the young team actually is almost like a work of historical fiction, you know, because even, I'm now 29, um, about 15 years older than Azzy was at the very beginning of that book, um, when I, when I read you that first excerpt, you know, and things change completely, um, so I want to show you the, the range of the young team, the, um, of course, as he grows, we 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 uh, we meet as he, our, our narrator and our main character when he's fourteen, and we're involved in the introduction to gang culture. We experience sectarianism, we experience the drugs, um, 
and then we shift. So it goes to Azzy when he's 18. Now they're driving, you know, they're driving about in the Dunnock Motors with the tunes on. They're going to the big graves, and that's when things start to go a bit peak tall. We see the mental effects of drugs and substance abuse, you know, with, with mental health at point blank range of anxiety. And then the last phase of the book, as he goes, and then he comes back, and he's drug free by this point, and now he's looking, you know, and he's, he's looking at the landscape almost as an outsider, and we go on a new journey with Azzy, um, as the inevitable gets sucked back in, you know, and the next two readings are going to talk about that, so I'm going to read for you again, guys. These two readings come for the very end part of the book, um... And as he's just returned from his uh, from his journey away, and he's getting sucked back into the the conflict and the violence. It's two hours later when I'm walking with the windy smashing. I was dreaming, and the noise wound its way in. My moss screaming broke the dream. I'm fucking soaking with sweat, and my eyes are stuck the gal. But I bounce up rapid and put an old Rangers tap in the trainers with no socks. I grab my bat and fly down the stairs. My ma's screaming for a bedroom. Stay in, Alan! Fuck that. I have a quick swatch at the front window before I bounce out in case there's a team waiting. There's broken glass all over the carpet and a half brick line in the middle. The Venetian blinds are all fucking bent. I rip the door open and peer out into the darkness behind the parked motors for any sign of movement. But the street is dead. I run down the steps into the garden and bounce off the fence. I'm jogging now, right up to the end of the road. I'd park my motor further down the street in anticipation of this shite. My ma's at the doorstep in her dressing gown and a few neighbours the lights are on cause of the noise. She looks fuming. The last thing she wants is the neighbours to see me out on a rampage with a bake bat. My ma's spitting out of farm lips. Get in here now! I keep the bat low and stand with it on the threshold. I wish some cunt made a run for it. I'd fucking kill them for doing this to my ma's house. She's pulling my arm back in the door. Please come back in. Alright, alright, I'm sorry, Mum. Second night back. Two nights it took for this nonsense to start again. I'll move out. And where will you go? Wherever you go, your trouble's going to follow you. No, it won't. I'm going to settle it once and for all. Oh, please, Alan, don't talk like that. I didn't mean to say things like this in front of my mum. What I said in anger. She took for gospel and it kept her up nights when I'd calmed down and was perfectly safe. She'd heard far too much violent talk across the years, talks of smashing and stabbing fuck it cunts in revenge that would never materialise once she sobered up and your blood was wiped off you with antiseptic. Women suffered as witnesses and nurses to her wars. It was the ones who love you, who cleaned you up, and who had to deal with the aftermath time and time again. I'm sorry. I didn't come back looking for trouble, Mum. I know that, but there's idiots here that will drag you back in. You can't keep losing your temper and running out to hit folk if they throw stones at your windows, Alan. You're playing right into their hands. People can't bear to see others getting on. She's bang on. I've no protests. You had spent your full youth learning to fight and act bold. Now you have to unlearn it. Don't retaliate, even if cunts are right in your face and laughing at you, because the one cunt you lift your hands to would get hurt. And you'd end up in court, and then it's finished. And there would be no life beyond all this, and all the struggle is for nothing. This is a new challenge, to keep that boldness inside, and let it go. You're right. I'm sorry about the windies and the blinds. I'm not bothering about those, it's you I'm worrying about. I don't want things to go back to the way they used to be. Honestly, I don't think I could manage now, not back to all that. My ma looks older with every word that comes out of her mouth. I can't offer any guarantees what would happen. This is the woman who taught me never to make a promise if you can't keep it. I can't promise everything's going to be alright, because you just never know about here. My ma doesn't deserve all this shit. She's looking elder and less capable of putting up with it. I wasn't one of the wains with pure young parents. Some cunts ma's are only in their early 40s when they're in their 20s. My ma's in her late fifties now, for a different time. She didn't understand all this, drugs and street violence. But she was well versed in the consequences. In the past, moments like this, 
I'd be fucking raging. Phoning my pals to go and cause havoc. But there's nobody who really left the phone. Where's the famous young team now? I'm alone. He faced my past. We see a maturity, you know, starting to come with Azzy, you know, and he recognises that this is serious, you know what I mean? There's been serious violence up to now. Um, he's gone away and that's afforded him great perspective in life, you know, and it takes a reader on a new journey, by the way, because we now look at it rather than an insider, but as an outsider. Somebody that loves and cares about these guys, but the, um, it's moved on, you know. Um, but guys, even in my own life, moving on, um, is one thing, you know, deciding I want a different life, I want to be somebody else, I can be more than I've been, you know, and, I, and I'm dreaming, I hope, and I've, I've got promise and talent, but making that come true and manifesting it is another story. Because um, too many guys, um, really, really good guys, you know, that I know, um, and myself included, you know, I've said that, you know, I want to change my life, I want to do something away from here, and you get sucked back in, you know, they're still using drink and drugs, they're substance dependent, you know, sometimes their mental health's in a bad way, they're self-medicating, and then being stuck in these environments out there, in these streets, you get sucked in, you know, with violence, with selling drugs, and guys, those those only ever end one way, you know, the bad way, you know, my own substance abuse ended on Christmas Eve 2012, um, guys, I reached rock bottom, all that stuff I told you about, you know, all the bravado, all the nonsense, it came to an end on that day, for me, because I was at rock bottom, you know, and it was that moment of clarity people talk about, and I was in a wee flat, I had nothing, I had no money, I had no Christmas cards, um, and I think that's what really hit it, because I was looking about, you know, and I used to love Christmas when I was a kid, you know, um, and I was, I was very lucky, you know, my mum always looked after me, single parent, but always had great Christmases, good times, and I was looking about this flat in my life, and I was like, this isn't my life, this is somebody else's life, you know, but unfortunately it's not, it's my life, and I've created this chaos, um, this substance dependence, this need, and this sadness, um, and guys, I've, you know, I'd be absolutely honest with you and say I didn't like myself very much, in fact I hated myself, um, I didn't think I was a nice person, and I didn't think I deserved any good things, but I was very lucky that I'd discovered train spotting. I'd went to university, and now I was in my fourth year of uni, and everybody, you know, says, oh, he's done brilliant, he's done brilliant, but guys, I wasn't free, I wasn't living free, because I was still trapped in a world of drugs and violence. And, um, you know, guys, that, that moment came for me, you know, at, at about tea time, and I looked at my life and I went, I can't go on, you know, and I broke down, guys, because I was looking and it, it actually all started off with one of my neighbours, an elderly woman, 86 she was, came and put a wee Christmas card through my door and it said, love Betty, number 16, I'll never forget it. And, um, you know, I broke down and I, in my crazy drug-induced state, I, I ran out to get Christmas cards and I said, I'm going to put them through all my neighbours' doors, right? It's going to save me, it's going to change my life. And I went away out and I couldn't get any because everything was shut. And I come back to my flat and I broke down, guys, I, I cried, honestly. And all the bravado, all the nonsense, all the gangs, there was nobody there apart from me, and I looked up to God and I went, I need help, please help me, and I prayed, guys. And instead of going out with a young team that night, I went to church with my mum. And the next day, I told her, something's different, my life's changed, something's going to change. And it did, because I never used drugs again, guys. I graduated that summer, and in those first few weeks of hard lift roll, I started writing this book. Seven years later, I'm delighted to tell you, I'm seven years off drugs. I'm nearly four and a half years off alcohol as well. Change my life, transform my future. Um, guys, and, you know, I'm still dealing with a lot of the trauma and, and all the stuff I went through back then. You know, a lot of sadness, a lot of lost friends, a lot of regrets and wasted time. I'm trying to make amends for that in the community. You know, and I'm going into schools, going into prison. Um, and you're trying to prevent, you know, you're trying to instill all this nonsense on people and say, guys, see all this that you, you're part of the new. It's going down, it's only going one way. Trust me, and you won't like where it goes, I've been there. Um, you know, and that's why I'm passionate about doing these talks and, and you know, and being brutally honest and saying, you know, and, and peeling back the bravado, guys, I talk about hard shells, hard shells. You know, I was a tough guy, jumping about in America peak. Didn't have feelings, guys. Underneath, I was struggling with mental health. I was incredibly lonely, right? Because going down that path, 
it's a very lonely road, you know. I looked at other people's lives and I thought, I want that life. Why have I not got that? Why am I not happy? Because I didn't choose happiness. I chose something else, you know. Guys, my last reading. Um, again, that wee trigger warning. This one's about suicide. Um, I should include myself in that, by the way, because one of my pals committed suicide over the summer. And it's a very difficult subject to be honest about and talk about. Um, and I'm somebody that struggles with mental health, I know. Um, but I know how incredibly valuable it is to talk about it. Um, and in, in my group chat only this week, my pals were all talking about it. You know, one of my pals has been struggling with depression and he came out in, in front of bravely, by the way, and, and commendable in front of everybody and went, I'm struggling with my mental health, guys. Um, I need to talk to somebody about it. And, you know, see the support and the love, by the way, got it. was heartwarming. Uh, it's making me quite emotional thinking about it. Um, but, guys, we know that there's loads of young people, men predominantly, right, that they've not got that supportive network, right, They've not got a trusted person where they can go and say, I'm really struggling now. Put their hand up and say, I need help. And guys, sometimes people do that bravely and they go to their GP and they don't get the help. They get waiting lists, they get antidepressants when they need to talk to somebody, you know. Um, it's an epidemic. And by the way, it was an epidemic that was with us long before COVID. And I, and, I, and I dare to say, unless we act and do something and encourage people to come forward and say, I need help, I'm struggling, it'll continue. Guys, that's my last reading. I hear my mom running up the stairs and I know something's coming. I can fucking tell by her hurried steps. And with everyone, my half dream disappears. My hand goes to the fag packet and I pull out an R1 and stick it in my gob and start spatting with a lighter. The Elgin usually chaps the door, but the day she just bursts in. I open my single eye to look at her. What is it, mum? Get dressed, Alan. How? Just do it, will you? For fuck's sake, what's happened? Stephen's mum and dad are at the door. Finnegan? Yes, Alan. How? Because Tony Marie's killed herself and Stephen is missing. They're asking to see you right now. Go up and put some clothes on. My head's fucking racing. And I think for a minute, this is just one of the periodic nightmares creeping into our lucid dream. That is not to be. No, this time. I drag extra hard in the smoke. This is not a drill. The stress hormones in my mind scream as I feel panicky and the regret light in the second fag. I try to keep focused on something so I don't lose it. But I get that overwhelming feeling when you hear bad news. Pure evil washing over you and making you feel nothing but dread. I felt that feeling before. It's shock hitting the emotional seawall deep within us. These knocks desensitise you to misery. Each one making you stronger and more resilient in accepting you the next, but robbing you each time you yeah, a precious piece of your humanity and future happiness. Overdoes. She hung herself. Now get up and talk to Connor and Joanne. Fuck me, two minutes. Up! I stand up with a fag between my lips and hunt for a pair of trackies to pull on. There's a wee bottle of water, and I'm taking a wee drink to try and separate my lips before I go and face these cunts. I bounced in the air, try to sort out my bed head and rub and sleep through my eyes. I've got a wee panicky feeling in my chest, but I'm trying to keep it down below. Times like these, you have to be strong, and I say a wee silent prayer to God to give you strength for a shite. My faith is buried deep within us, but I only flirt with the notion of divine power at Christmas, and maybe Easter or not. I think in passing, I do believe, because this evil is near random. It's concentrated among cunts for bad areas and their daily struggle additional sufferings. Days like this, faith is all you have to cling to. The fingernails if necessary. You couldn't do this alone. I'm going to jump a wee bit because he goes on to talk about the details. Um, but the most important bit for me in this, guys, is the effect on Azzy um, as well. He promises to go and look for, for Finnegan, her boyfriend who's missing, who's the um, the son of these parents. I jump back up the stair and stick my old trainers and hoodie on. My mouth's still stuck together and I feel fucking starving but sick in my stomach and all. It cramps at times like these and makes us feel like I've got an ulcer. Stress, the doctor down there said. Understandable really. 
on days like this. You could eat a Meprazole at Smarties and it wouldn't make a fucking bit of difference to that non-feeling buried within you. My convictions hold, but it takes a physical toll of this. And the elder you are, the worse it is, body and mind. It's all trauma, whether it's happening to you or you bear witness to it. You have to work and earn money in a stressful job and try to be an adult and have prospects and relationships and run a house. This shite piles on top and makes it too much to handle. It's all a matter of time and compression. Hard-boiled? Aye. But how long can you resist and keep intact before the cracks start to appear? I'm past that point in no return. This is a salvage operation now. Guys, we don't escape through this life without picking up trauma. You know, and trauma is invisible wounds. Um, and lots of young men that live this life deal with PTSD, deal with complex trauma. Um, which is the effect of all these combined hurts, you know, for, for existing in a violent atmosphere, so on and so forth for across the years, you know. But what I would encourage anybody to do, if you see a young man or woman struggling and they put their hand up and they ask, don't ignore it, guys, because it could save their life. And see if you tell somebody about your own trauma, you could save your own. Um, I'm very, very vocal about that. And, you know, I I was very honest in the young team. And it's tough even for me to be honest about mental health, even though I've written about it. Because um, it, it, it's ongoing, guys. In periods of stress in my own life, you know, I'll struggle. And I'll feel anxious and I'll know where to go to busy places. I'm scared, you know, I struggle with flying when I never used to. Um, it can affect you in all, co- all sorts of ways. But my message to anybody is it does get better with the right conditions, you know. Um, especially when you resolve drugs and alcohol. So, um, that moves us nicely onto the last part of this, um, which is the questions uh, from the um, for some of our readers out there, um, for the guys in the community. So, um, I'm going to read the question and then I'll just answer it as if somebody's asked me. It's these crazy COVID times, guys. Let me get a wee drink, sorry. So, Andy from Dumbarton has asked, how much impact did train spotting have on you? Guys, train spotting was fundamental for me. Um, I stayed on at school. Te- we were told not to leave unless you had a job because the economy was crashing, you know, it was 2007, 2008. And um, so I did. And the girl sat next to me said, what are you going to do for your personal study? Because we had to choose a book. And I says, I don't know. And I seen a boy sitting there doing the Godfather and I went, mm, nah, that might be the boy. And um, she said, you should do train spotting. And I said, that's one of my favourite films. I didn't even know that was a book. And she said, aye, it's a book. And um, I said to one of my friends, and she bought it for me, right, kindly. And um, I remember the transformative power when I opened that book and I read The Sweat Was Fucking Lashing Off His Sick Boy, first line. It blew me away, honestly. And it was that power of representation because I was in the back of police motors, I was sitting in cells, I'd seen three of my mates just die here in overdoses, and then I read this book that reflected all that experience, and it told me, a gang member, an Ed, a nobody, a, a troublemaker, that, do you know what, the world of literature's for you too. Um, it had a massive impact, it saved my life, it transformed my future, um, and I give thanks to Irvin Welsh, you know, and that great book, because it, it changed my life. And that's the power of representing unrepresented people. That um, Papers are far too quick to say, ah, the people who populate this book, they won't read it. You know, it's all for us, you know, it's for middle class people. Bullshit. I'm calling bullshit. All right. Thank you, Andy. Um, Jay for Clyde Bank said, is it difficult to write about gangs without sometimes making them seem too exciting? I think it's an absolute tightrope. You know, I mentioned a couple of titles there and, and I've got a lot of time and respect for those titles as well. You know, Football Factory, Green Street, I love them. Do I think they're handling as tactful and sensitive always? No, not always. Um, that doesn't make them no good films or no exciting, by the way. I love them. But when you're trying to be progressive and you're trying to change things, I think it's crucial to show beneath the hard shell. You know, so that those readings I did and that, that honesty I offer to people when I talk, talking about faith, Talking about finding God, talking about struggling with mental health, talking about romantic relationships, even, do you know what I mean? And not talking about oh, the birds and all that, we do all that, right? That's not that's all the banter, right? That's the pub, the lad chat. But underneath, even gang members have feelings, right? They get scared too, they get lonely, right? They fall in love, right? 
And that is where the true power of the young team lies, you know, because it's actually saying underneath all the hard man and all the nonsense, there's trauma, there's hurt, there's humanity. Um, and I hope, you know, that answer can only rest with you guys, guys. If the, if I manage to achieve a book and a story that doesn't glorify gang culture, but shows up for it what it is, you know, a dangerous path um, with an uncertain future. So thank you, Jay. Which books would you recommend to young people who are currently reluctant readers? Roof. Um, honestly, by the way, I would recommend any book to any young person. And I mean that. And I know you were looking for specific books, right? Naturally, I'd recommend The Young Team by Graham Armstrong. I'm like, um, But honestly, right, I remember sitting in an English class, right? And see the te- I was reading a Goosebumps book because I loved Goosebumps, right? It's a horror series by R.L. Stein for aimed at young people. The standard of English in them is pretty shit, to be honest with you. Um, but the stories were fantastic. I loved all that. I was alright we go when we were young, right? We were always into ghosts and all that and um, scary movies. Me and my sister loved all that, right? So see, even in high school, see if I seen a Goosebumps book, I just used to grab it, right? And I would, and I'd sit and read it, and she's like, "That's not a proper book, you know. That's not a, what's a proper book." To lots of people, that isn't a proper book. Too much swearing. Too much this, too much that. Put a book in their hand, whatever they want to read, right? Because see if you start reading stuff you like, eventually you will read stuff that you think you ought to read or you'll wander into a bookshop and you'll grab a book and you'll transform. You know, I, I read Trainspot and Urban Welsh about heroin addicts in, the, in Leaf in the 80s. The next book I read was The Great Gatsby, The Roaring Twenties, you know. Um, any book, Ruth, thank you. Jamie's asked, how much of Ozzy's life was like your own? Um, Jamie, it's a question that I get asked all the time. Um, and the reality is, everything within the young team was inspired by real stuff. The cavalry didn't always ride in and save the day, right? I hope you know what I mean by that, right? Fiction has to make sense. It has to be exciting. It has to make you want to keep turning pages. The reality wasn't like that often. There was loads of nothing. And then there was these crazy flashpoints, you know? Um, I experienced gang culture, I experienced serious gang violence, um, I was stabbed in the back with a Buckfast bottle, um, I was seriously assaulted with Buckfast bottles on other occasions to my injury, very luckily they didn't bust but I was hit in the face, um, in the back of the head, I've got scars on my back, um, so my exposure to gang violence was real, I was a member of two gangs, um, I would be absolutely honest with that, I was substance dependent, um, you know, all those things inspired me to create this fictional world set in a very real world with real experiences. But um, if you were in a young team, you know this is quite obviously fiction because of the names, the young team, the young toy. It sounds almost fake, but I wanted to make it as real as possible, saying YT fucking P, you know what I mean? YT fucking P, YTB. It sounds like the stuff we said. Um, so there's truths, there's half-truths, there's shared experiences, but the majority of it um, I experienced. Thank you, Jamie. Um, Liz from Dalmuir has asked, what is your next novel going to be about? <clears throat> I'm glad you asked. Um, my next novel is Raveheart, so it's based... I was actually sitting talking about it with a friend today and I was getting that buzz for it. Um, Raveheart... <coughs> excuse me. Raveheart is all about dance music. There's two raves in the book that we got to, guys. In real life, we went to 22. I loved raving. I was an absolute cheesy, quaver, hardcore raver. Um... Renegade Master and the next book if you ask where it sits compared to the young team it's a comedy guys it's meant to make people laugh it's not a serious thing it's halfway between Kevin and Perry Go Large and Indiana Jones right DJ Wally is a hero he's a DJ down at the time capsule in Coat Bridge he gets sacked and he goes on a quest to reunite all his fallen heroes of dance music for the golden age Scooter you name it all of those ones so it's going to be fun a roaring tale Thank you, Liz. And then Ali Fay Bonhill has asked, I understand that you do a lot of talks in schools and prisons. What message do you want to give to young people about gang life? And this is a great question to end on. Um, guys, gangs are seductive. They exist in communities where there's not a lot of other stuff to do. Um, poverty in gangs is linked. But I would say, and I, we used to think we were the tough guys, right? I used to watch our young, I used to go to Boys Brigade on a Friday night, right? And then I got too cool for that and I was like, I'm not going there, you know what I mean? I'm going to do the trips to drink the wine and fight and all that. 
And we used to look at the guys going into the boys' brigade, right? And you're fucking gay, you know what I mean? You're the fucking young team, you know what I mean? I regret that so bitterly that I can't... Honestly, it actually makes me want to greet. I wish I was one of the guys who had walked past us and went straight into there to play football and they hang about with the good guys because we were the bad guys, right? And see, those young guys that were all in there, they've all got wives, they've got homes, they go on holidays, they've got fantastic jobs, they've got kids, they've had a great life because they took the right road, no the wrong road. Me and my kind... We are struggling, that's the truth. We're struggling with mental health, we're struggling to find a career, we're struggling with substance dependence, we're struggling with crime, violence, drug dealing. Um, I'm safely beyond all that, but that doesn't mean my pals are, you know, and I'm still care about them, and I'm still wearing them, you know what I mean? And I need to hear when things go wrong, when they get attacked, when, hang, when they lose money, when they go to prison. You know, I would say to any young man, right, about gang life, if you can avoid it, guys, run, do not stop, keep running, don't stop, go and take the future that you so righteously deserve, um, because see, especially down in London right now, it's their control, you know, they are where we were um, 15 years ago, people are carrying knives, they're carrying weapons, they're shooting, um, it's all fueled by selling drugs, you know, um, and um, and then my heart goes out, especially to the young um, BAME members of that community, because that's what it tends to affect them. They're all after them, London. I've seen it with my own eyes. I lived in Wood Green, and, and uh, I used to go shopping in Tottenham. And that was where one of the infamous gang wars between N17 and N22 happened. There was shootings. There was a girl killed in, by a Mac 10 machine gun. A teenage girl um, caught in the crossfire. There's boys killed with shotguns, with nice. Guys, these young men deserve a future. Right? Our young men deserve a future, and by the way, we are slipping back. I see it all the time. Casual culture, Green Brigade, UB07, you'll see it's spray painted all over. All the young boys wearing the Stone Island again. They're drinking, they're taking prop cocaine. Guys, we're going backwards, and if you look at the trend, right, for the Office of National Statistics, right, violence has been increasing for 2014. It's a steady rising trend. Um, it concerns people at me. You know, because we see it at street level. Politicians see it as well. Cops see it. Violence reduction unit sees it. And everybody, I hope, we're all moving in the same direction. You know, and there's good people out there, by the way, that'll try to change lives, transform futures and save young men's lives. Um, you know, and I'm very, very privileged and proud to have stood beside them, you know, and to help them with their work. Um, and I hope the young team feeds into that. Um, it was very challenging to write, it was a very lonely, hard process, guys, it took seven years, it took 300 rejections, but I know the power of a book, because that girl who put train spotting in my hand saved my life, it changed my family's life, I would have been up in the cemetery, you know, I wouldn't have made it, I know that, the way I took drink, the way I took drugs and the way I drank alcohol, I wouldn't have made it, you know, I'd have probably killed myself with that, could have died violently, you never know, I thank God, so, um, I hope that's an answer, you know, that forget the glamour, forget the stuff you hear in rap songs and grime and all that, that's a glamorised portrait of where it is, because it's a very lonely, dangerous road, um, and you, when you get to the end of that road, there's sometimes no one not waiting for you, you know, um, all our young people deserve a future, and there's a future out there for them, um, guys, thank you so much for listening, um, there's so much to talk about with this book, and there's, it's a vast subject, gang culture in Scotland. There's a great history to it. There's there's all sorts of academic works you can read, um, and there's people out there that are fighting and trying to calm Hutchison, Nicole, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, um, Natalie McLean from Cisco. Look at these people online, guys. The Violent Reduction Unit, headed by Nevin Rennie, they are trying to do something about this. They have been. We are one of the world leaders at reducing violence now in Scotland. Um, you know, we don't want to go back, I don't think anybody wants to go back to the bad old days, you know, where our young people are carrying knives and committing violent offences and, and killing each other, essentially, um, and I hope that the young team's a small part of that solution, guys. Thank you so much, thank you to Western Barton Libraries for asking me to do this, thank you to everybody that's asked a question, thank you to everybody that's watched, um, I, uh, I hope it's of some value to you, thank you very much, God bless.